Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second uh, meeting of Transmedia Art Seminar at uh, Mahindra Humanities Center and MetaLab at Harvard. Uh, my name is Magda Romanfa, and I'm co-chairing the seminar with my colleague Ramona Moss, who is going to be presenting today about her uh, project and viral theaters. Uh, the project has been uh, sponsored by uh, Volkswagen Foundation, and it's a collaboration between uh, Volkswagen Foundation and Free University at Berlin. And we are thrilled uh, to have Ramona today uh, from Free University of Berlin to talk about the project and to introduce us to the findings of the project. The project um, involved many months of studying and researching and the theatrical responses to pandemic and the different forms of hybrid theater that emerged during uh, the pandemic. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Ramona and um, I'm gonna give her the space right now. And as always, uh, thank you to Mahindra and to MetaLab for hosting us today. Great, thank you so much, Magda. And um, thank you so much for having me and in general, um, I'm just very glad to be here, um, both as a new co-curator of the Transmedia Art Seminar and also today to be um, uh, talking about uh, viral theatres, the project that I'm involved in. But I first of all just would like to thank, thank Magda again for um, all her amazing work in kind of putting this seminar together and in um, asking me to collaborate with her on this. She's a real inspiration, I think, in terms of um, how she's exploring kind of what, you know, the interstices between scholarship, um, uh, art and public space. And so I think um, an event like this is just uh, really wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to the entire season of this. Um, so, um, so yes, so um, what I would like to do today um, is to um, give you a sense here um, about the project that um, that I'm uh, leading, um, Viral Theatres, um, which is an artistic research project that, um, as Magda said, uh, is funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, but is also a collaboration between the Free University Berlin, um, Bard College Berlin, and the Humboldt University Berlin. So I just want to give you an introduction to both the methods that we were using, the team that's been working on it, and the core concept of 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 archiving, which is at the center of the project, really. And then um, secondly, I want to give you some context of the shift in practices that has occurred in German theater more generally since spring 2020, and how, um, and kind of examples quite, uh, of what we've been documenting. And here, I really want to look um, very much at individual case studies from the independent scene. And then I want to hone uh, down on our own sort of practical artistic experimentation um, that kind of supplements the documentation process that we've been going through, which is sort of actually VR experimentation in trying out sort of hybrid performance formats. So that will be kind of my last example and sort of closing idea. So, um, <clears throat> And I'll, I'll finish off with some notes on what that hybrid future might look like. So that's the roadmap and um, let's um, get started. So I will um, share my screen and um, give you a little teaser taster. What does the future of theater look like? I hope the, the sort of experimental risk-taking aspect of theatre can be applied when you're making mixed reality or digital work as well. I think this is really exciting here because we're watching theatre to try to figure out what it is and how it's going to differentiate itself from all of those different other entertainment modes and forms. Which will be a, which will be a real challenge, but, but every time there's a challenge, every time in theatre history there's like great new technological challenge. It's afforded a whole bunch of other opportunities. That's my hope. I think it will go is is sort of, yeah, what you were saying earlier about the hybrid models. I think we'll be live streaming, or not necessarily live streaming, but we'll be streaming and we'll be in, in live scenarios. And I think that's that's a really good combo. I think I think that's really, really positive. Theater's kind of crude in that way. Like we're just people in a room making some magic tricks happen. So how does the work, if it's presented digitally, how does it still capture that feeling of like, so we're just figuring this out. <laughs> you know, the, the, the humbleness of what theater is as a form. 
and an interesting I don't know I just think it's really interesting to think that in like 50 years someone will be like oh yeah but aren't you doing a stream of it as well and we'll be like oh well we actually didn't always used to do streams it was only because there was this thing it was called the coronavirus pandemic like you weren't born then <laughs> prior to that nobody would ever live stream a theater apart from the national into a cinema once a year so I think that that's quite cool So what you've just heard then um, is part of a sound installation um, that um, we created based on an interview series that we ran across the last 18 months with um, artists, both in Germany and internationally. So there's a German version with German speaking artists, and then there's an international version with international artists. Um, <clears throat> and um, that kind of documents in a sort of oral history, the experiences they were making during the pandemic. So we have we ask each one of them uh, similar questions about both their work practices and how they shifted ideas about digitality and liveness and about the future of theatre, which is that excerpt that you heard, or one of a little bit of from the excerpt that you heard here. Um, and I think so this really lies at the heart of um, our project, viral theatres, um, and that's the idea of sort of a mix of creative documentation and um, artistic experimentation. Um, and um, as a sort of collaborative format, um, the important thing is really to kind of think about like, you know, to have the this encounter between artists and scholars be at the center of it. So we felt very much when we started out the project that the this was something that couldn't happen just um, um, from the sidelines as a sort of from a distance sort of scholarly position that we had to be always in dialogue with the artists and sort of track their um, experiences and challenges. And so that's also why um, the team looks the way it looks like. So I'm just going to um, give you a brief overview. So we're four of us. Um, there is Nina Tecklenburg, who's a um, um, an independent theatre maker and a scholar. There is Christian Stein, who is a VR um, a sort of developer and uh, works a lot in mu museums and performance with VR. And there's Janina Janke, and he's also a scholar of computer sciences at the Humboldt University. And there's Janina Janke, who's another independent artist. So we had sort of like scholarship and artists interviewing the entire time. And that was um, one of the important parts here. Um, and so the interdisciplinary and dialogical um, aspect is really at the core. Um, and in doing so, our goal has been um, the building of what we would like to call a living archive to document shifts in cultural practices and experience during the pandemic. Um, and to kind of give you a sense then of the method that we were using. Um, so it's a mixed method approach really um, to create a digital living archive made up of three streams of documents. One are documents focusing on artists' work and their experiences. That was done um, through research residencies at select Berlin theaters during the lockdowns, shadowing rehearsals for digital or hybrid productions, both at the Deutsches Theater. And um, I'll, you'll see a little bit of some of that later um, and the Hebel am Ufer Theater, as well as conducting these extensive interviews that then um, are like many, many, many hours of interviews that we then decided um, to cut together um, in order to be able to kind of showcase this as a sound installation for a broader audience. Um, then there's documents of audience experience, so a digital multimedia survey that we created for German um, theater audiences and how their experience shifted um, during the pandemic. And then there is documents um, that emerge from a pedagogical framing um, of digital theater, so student contributions to this living archive. And that's part of a, an undergraduate network course on digital theaters that we are running with um, six different campuses as part of the Open Society University Network that sits at Bard College um, in Annandale and that Bard College Berlin is a part of and that um, the other participating partners are Birkbeck, CEU as at Central European University um, in Vienna, the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota and Witzwatersand University in Johannesburg. So, um, so we kind of supplemented the sort of ethnographic graphic research with creative practice um, in order to sort of then reflect on and generate more um, archival material. 
um, and the various documents that we um, that we uh, created then are being stored both in the digital um, version of the archive that we're currently building, and they're also showcased in a um, participatory exhibition that we curated as part of the project. Um, and that opened this year in April in 2022 at the Tieranatomisches Theater in Berlin, which is a sort of um, experimental exhibition space and is currently now also running at the Theater Museum in Dusseldorf, so um, a little bit further um, afield. And I'll just give you a sense so that you have sort of a broad overview of what um, that sort of output or that aspect of the archive looks like. Um, I'll just show you a trailer from the um, from our um, exhibition, and the, so this is the this is the um, the exhibition space in Berlin, where we did the exhibit in April, and where we also did a site specific performance, the VR experiment um, that I will be talking about at the end of this talk, um, and um, this is the um, video that I want to show you that gives you kind of a sense of the different spaces and the way that we were trying to kind of um, exhibit the di digital in a non-digital space. Right. So, um, so the last few few images that you saw were both um, were parts of. So we had three different types of spaces. One was called Archives of the Future, which had um, theatre letters from around the world from artists that were writing in, and this was um, a collaborative project that was associated with us, um, organized by Nachtkritik, a journal in Berlin, and. Um, Theatre Journal in Berlin and the um, Free University. And then um, we also collaborated with uh, the Harvard Meta Lab on also exhibiting their manifesto. So um, as a sort of like viewpoint out into the future that underlined the documentation that we were doing um, ourselves. And then the two spaces that we created in terms of um, um, exhibiting the, the documents that we have were on, we tried to figure out what were the sort of core elements um, and the core ideas for, you know, what that, that symbolized the pandemic. So on the one le level, then we had a home office that was thinking about work. And um, in that space, there was, um, we exhibited both um, different theater projects that thought about work or um, um, documents that really, and videos and audio material that really engaged with the transformation of this work process. Um, and there was also a participatory stage where, a uh, space where, you know, people con could contribute and that table that you can see over there where people could kind of write little notes as well. And there was a um, continuous translation process between digital spaces and analog spaces or sort of actual space and sort of retranslating from one to the other. And the other, so when you were not in your home office, you were in your home cinema watching Netflix on your on your sofa. So here, um, all the sort of video documentations that we um, that we conducted, those were placed in um, in on the big screen in the the cinema space, and then people could watch that there together with um, uh, with a few trailers from participating. Um, arts organizations and, and collectives. Um, so that's the sort of um, broad overview of, um, of, what this, uh, of what this looks like really, the, um, the exhibition that we did. Um, and I think the interesting thing though then is to sum it up then the display of what we've collected and the generation of further material for the archives go hand in hand. Um, because with the help of um, the attending installation audiences, we created further and more material for the archives. So the audience box, which is the sort of weird telephone box that you see at the back there on one of the images, was um, the sort of audience box where people could contribute their own experiences during the pandemic. So, um, 
So the living nature of the archive then emerges from it being interactive, open-ended and looped. And experiencing the collection and, contri and contributing to it coalesce in the exhibition itself. And in doing that, we were drawing on kind of Matthew Reason's idea of audiencing as a way of privileging audience experience as an exchange with and an extension of the performance. And this pri privilege on participation also underlines um, the space from which we as researchers seek to speak. That is not as having a privileged position of distance, but rather as collectors embedded in the same state of exception that the COVID pandemic has created. The key was to document across the various dimensions of the theatrical event and engaging with artists, audiences and students alike. Um, so the Living Archive um, will ultimately then in the end be handed over to the Berlin Academy of the Arts when this project finishes and be included in their COVID pandemic archive that they're currently creating and of which 40 different institutions in Germany are um, participating in. So that's the overview. Um, and I think there is something in terms of the sort of more abstract and theoretical framework um, of archiving that I'd like to talk about now. There's something very interesting about this encounter of these two kinds of archive that we are ourselves sort of now engaged in. On the one hand, our own sort of randomly growing participatory living archive that has a sort of digital leg and also a sort of analog um, um, analog leg in a way. Um, and then this ultimate destiny of this whole project in going to one of the um, foremost arts institutions in Berlin, in the Academy of the Arts. Um, and this gap between the two, um, in that gap, I think one can observe the sort of radical transformation that the idea of the archive has undergone, not just through the pandemic, obviously already beforehand, I wanna trace some of that, but um, how the pandemic itself then also um, kind of reiterates and challenges some of these ideas. So, um, um, these looped versions of archiving then uh, point to a radical transformation, as I said, and um, this is something that John Hartley already, like in the um, in 2012, has termed the network or probability archive that's enabled by the automatic self-documenting function of digital media. Um, the digital thus fundamentally changes what we understand by an archive. Um, and uh, Diane Taylor, obviously, um, in her seminal study on archive and repertoire, describes um, the archive as, um, as and distinguishes um, a sort of um, makes a distinction between an institutionalized form of knowledge that is almost exclusively textual and the embodiment as an alternate form of knowledge production. Um, and she writes about that sort of like more classical concept of the archive. The archive from the Greek etymologically refers to a public building, a place where records are kept. From arche, it has the meaning of a beginning, the first place, the government. By shifting the dictionary entries into a syntactical arrangement, we might conclude that the archival from the beginning sustains power. Um, so public, state-owned and state-making, and that obviously is also what the Academy of Arts, sort of where everything is ending up in, is sort of stands for and as a sort of seat of power. And then in contrast, Susan Sontag, um, that I have also here on that slide, um, sort of appropriates a sense of power to her own private documentation endeavors. And she says, I perceive value, I confer value, I create value, I even create or guarantee existence, hence my compulsion to make lists. So the personal and the institutional then run up against one another, and they also show the scope of how archives might begin or end. It is in this fluctuation between public and private, but also in the fluctuation between media that the living archive of viral theater situates itself. Um, by generating more and more contributions that are sort of random rather than controlling what enters the archive, um, it ties into a sort of fundamental shift and an appropriation of the concept of the archive by the digital. Um, and digital theatre positions itself differently to archive and rec repertoire, because here each performance comes along as its own archival trace, right? So there is virtually no distinction between live performance and archival recording anymore. And to kind of reinforce that anecdotally, when my colleague and I showed a group of our students as part of this digital theater seminar, a recording of Gob Squad's 2021 show, um, Show Me a Good Time, um, a sort of digital durational piece that had geographically dispersed performers attempt to capture the idea of an evening at the theater, 
at a distance and sort of fragmented and distance from each other. When we showed that to the students, it became evident that the markers that they have for liveness were ones where they couldn't actually distinguish whether this was still a recording or whether this was live because the markers of sort of proximity to the camera and sort of direct address, et cetera, et cetera, were also there in the, um, in the recording. So this blurring of borders raises important questions about not just how to archive digital material, um, but rather what an archive means um, that is identical with the advent of performance. So um, I think there's a really interesting sort of like to, um, to uh, was a really interesting theorist for us to kind of think through when we were developing our idea of, of, of what our archive was supposed to do or, or look like. Um, and that is Abigail de Kosnick. So she kind of developed this very evocative concept in uh, 2016. So also pre-pandemic for an inter interaction with digitality that is uh, the idea of a rogue archive. Um, and I'll just um, give you kind of a little sense of that. So memory has gone rogue in the sense that it has come um, loose from its fixed place in the production cycle. Many rogue digital archives has as their primary mission, the collection and storage of user versions. Um, so this idea of distributed forms of collection and iterative production that Dick Kosnick highlights, they exist pre-pandemic and they exist by default of the internet, right? But obviously I think the pandemic kind of makes, a, makes for a really interesting intervention here in a way, because the pandemic reshapes the idea of the archive by turning us all into sort of ad hoc archivists of a state of exception that was shared globally. And this archiving marked the sense um, of a sort of shared experience. And in that sense, the digital infrastructures of Dikosnik's rogue archiving come into their own with the historic event of um, COVID-19. Because the awareness of this global reach and the need for documentation is mirrored in the abundance of performance and artistic projects during lockdown that work on the principle of, um, um, of collection and documentation of this state of exception. That means that we are not so much here talking about a re-performing of the archive or performing remains, but instead of creative archiving as a dominant genre of artistic production during the pandemic. Um, these manifold efforts uh, and documentation and collection across different strata harness the de democratizing and grassroots function of the internet as an enabling um, as enabling kind of dispersed forms of collaboration and memorializing. Um, so that means ultimately that our own sort of effort to say like how can we document the pandemic is not um, is not special or unique. It's rather a tool also to highlight this increase in creative documentation project that emerged globally in response to the pandemic. Um, and I would like to now look at three examples of these creative archives and, um, and to kind of showcase some of them. So I'm just gonna um, go out of my um, thing and show you the websites for these because they're particularly interesting. Wait a second. So here is the um, here are three of these uh, three examples that um, that I have, um, and that's on the one level um, um, down at the bottom on the left is uh, Decameron Row. It's a hundred artists that created one minute lockdown reflections. There were dance pieces. There were um, fictional sort of um, pieces of writing. There were just um, little videos um, that. Um, um, that experimented with sort of uh, everyday objects. There was a wide range of things. And then obviously the Decameron kind of um, framework then is sort of related to history of pandemics um, and kind of gives us these little glimpses. Then there is um, Joshua um, Gelb, which probably is quite well known in the US, obviously, because I think was quite um, um, popular, obviously, during that, um, during the um, lockdown phases. And he did sort of little um, performance pieces all out of his closet in the Lower East Side. So that was called Theatre in Quarantine, and he was kind of sending out a series of performances. But in and of itself, these then kind of um, were reflections on that question of restri restriction, spatial restriction, loneliness, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the top, is a thousand scores, which is a um, uh, a project that was done by the 
um, by um, the Remini Protocol, which is a German uh, performance collective um, that's also internationally quite well known. And they um, created instructional performances. So in a way, these are just scripts and scores for uh, for the audience to kind of visit for the user or the audience, no, no matter you, however you would like to call it. So the user goes onto the website, checks out one of the scores, and then with the help of that score, creates their own performance that then they can um, kind of send back or send to the artists that have created this. Uh, so there's uh, a thousand different instructions for how to make performances. So when the theater is closed, you are the one that is thrown back on yourself that can create performance on your own with the help um, of, these, um, of these instructions. So I think what these show are, is kind of both the breadth of um, of different kind of approaches to this idea of kind of how to document that pandemic experience, um, but um, they also I think what's interesting interesting and important is that they are not really. Um, so much marked by a sense of uniqueness or novelty, um, but rather instead uh, they're united by a sense of sort of resonance and recognition of artists, of people sharing the same coping methods around the world. In that sense, the rogue archiving that I would like to class these three examples as um, are not so much um, reiterating and recycling existing material as like a lot of rogue archiving um, is doing pre-pandemic, um, but um, they document as a way of connection across geographies. In that sense, they exemplify a sort of fundamental urge that connect pandemics and documentation, and that can be seen also um, in a much older sort of piece of um, of documenting pandemics that, um, that I would like to kind of um, throw at you as a sort of uh, as a way of kind of um, another piece of um, that might resonate with these sort of different attempts at sort of documentation, um, documentation of um, a very particular kind of experience. And that's, um, I would like to go to the narr narrator of um, Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year from 1722, um, which is um, a supposed sort of eyewitness account um, of um, somebody experiencing the Great London Plague in 1665, 1666, um, except that Defoe's um, writing is actually not an eyewitness account, but a sort of fictionalized distillation of, um, of that sort of great pandemic. Um, on the basis of his, of definitely on the basis of research, but the uh, the impetus is that this happens. Obviously, his own sort of writing of it doesn't happen um, close to the 1665, but like years and years later, and therefore has this sort of interesting way of how to mix documentation with fictionalization. And so, what he says here, I now began to consider seriously with myself concerning my own case and how I should dispose of myself. That is to say, whether I should resolve to stay in London or shut up how and flee, because I know um, not, but it may be of moment to the, these who come after me, if they come to be brought to the same distress and to the same manner of making their choice, and therefore I de desire this account may path, pass with them, rather for a direction to themselves to act by than a history of my actings. So um, here again, this idea of, you know, documentation as a form of instruction, kind of like the instructional pieces that Rimini Protocol is talking about here also he his uh, motivation of the narrator is one of of ultimate um instruction to others and kind of like looking forward and looking into the future rather than into the past with this um with this iteration so so it it, it journal of the plague year then is a sort of interesting sort of reference point in many ways because it does not only resonate across history, it also resonates in terms of method, since Defoe is not only the not the eyewitness that he claims, but creates this fiction-like dis distillation of London, the London plague. Creative making and documenting then coincide here as much as the in the pandemic archiving as we've just been looking at. So there is a sort of nice shared kind of ground here. So I now, um, 
would like to move to um, to the second part of my uh, of my talk and to some of the actual examples of artistic work and the sort of case studies that we've um, that we've documented um, and and give you a bit of the sort of context of the of the German um, situation. So um, let me do that. So shifts in practices, uh, shifts in method and practice in German theatre. Um, so Germany, and specifically Berlin, is often named as a sort of major capital of theatre making, while there remains a curious mix of sort of confusion and admiration internationally about its governmentally funded um, and highly subsidised state theatre system. So I want to suggest that this often cited exceptionality of German theatre realised itself once more during the pandemic in at least two ways. One, in theory, German theatre uh, remained fundamentally and overwhelmingly committed to the communal encounter of bodies in space and engaged in turn in a particularly fervent debate about whether the digital turn in the pandemic could even still be considered theatre. Yet in practice, German theatre weathered the pandemic lockdowns with the benefit of huge emergency funding released by the government for state theatres, but also the independent scene and festival organisers alike, and thus created better conditions for artists with the shutdowns, um, to deal with the shutdowns of cultural institutions and public space. So these new emergency funding supplies um, provided support to emerging artists that have never previously been funded and thus expanded the scope of financing new forms of digital artistic practice. So um, at least at the beginning of the pandemic and in 2020, 2021, that is true. I would say that obviously now um, things are radically shifting again. Um, for various political reasons, and we can talk about that later. So, but in 2020 and 2021, the German Cultural Ministry made available the large scale emergency funding package Neustart Kultur or New Start for Culture, a rescue program providing uh, 1 billion euros for the German cultural scene, music, dance, arts, literature, and theater to buffer the effects of lockdown. In addition, the German government in the summer of 2021 added, added further uh, billion um, financial package to reboot the running of cultural events. On the one hand, this has made possible a range of digitization projects in state theatres who were able to continue working behind closed doors with staff continuing to be on pay payroll, able to produce new productions via live stream and mostly available for free or for a voluntary fee online, um, and thus moving beyond only streaming archival material. Beyond the larger institutions, the extensive funds for individual independent theatre makers experimenting with digital formats also supported a boost of transformation projects, funding the translation of existing analog projects into digital counterparts, um, or in addition, in addition to developing entirely new work. Such transformation processes also worked in the opposite direction, interestingly. So whilst 2020 and early 2021 um, transferred analog into digital formats, there's then an increasing push for digital work to be transformed into further hybrid formats that can be performed on the German stages after the reopening of the 2021-22 season. And I will um, show you an example of that in a moment. So overall, this massive boost in funding offered an opportunity to identify new cultural players in an otherwise com um, competitive funding scene. That is to say, not only were established artists and performance makers in the independent scene supported by Neustadt Kultur, increasingly emerging artists that had not yet had access to any funding schemes before were able to gain access and thus had a chance to realize some of their artistic vision or to sort of just enter the um, theater landscape on a, on a grander scale. So um, one example um, of an independent theater collective that literally, literally kind of became constituted through the pandemic, and that is also part of our living archive, um, is the young performance group Punkt Adopt Life. Um, uh, and their um, digital adaptation of um, Goethe's The Sorrows of the Young Werther. The, that production went viral in uh, 2021 um, and gained sort of by gaining sort of national and international recognition. So coming straight out of film and drama school, um, the group formed around uh, the film directing student Cosmia Spelikan from the start. They were an extremely young and interdisciplinary group. 
um, willing to pair film, social media, literature, and theater. In doing so, they updated Werther's love story into pandemic times and had Werther's sorrows play out in a multi-platform version across Instagram, WhatsApp, and Zoom, into which the audience could also enter by chatting with the characters via their Instagram accounts during the performance. So Cosmia Stalikin and Johnny Hoff, who is the um, one of the main actors, um, the actor of Werther in this case, um, are also part of a bulk of theater makers, critics and scholars um, that Viral Theatres interviewed as part of the oral history project that you just heard. And they talked there about how they came together um, and found ways of working across geographies. So the performers and team conducted the entire six month rehearsal period on Zoom and only ever had a chance to meet in person after the Werther Live opened. Um, Johnny Hoff, um, the actor playing Werther, described his own situation in spring 2020 as follows. So I just completed performing in the finals production of my acting school on February 15, 2020. And then in March, I was on my way to go to Cologne to perform in The Damned. But then um, the directing assistant called me up and said, lockdown, we are no longer performing, go home. Um, it was very scary for me. I had consciously decided against a fixed contract at a state theater just then. This would have been not so bad without the corona pandemic, um, but with it, I spent most of March at home doing yoga three or four times a week and crying for an hour solid. However, Spellikin then connected with Hoff and convinced him to join Werther. After the successful production of Werther Live, the team decided to found themselves as a more permanent collective and went on stage, um, on to stage Move Alive, um, where, which is the Seagull Live in early 2022. Um, and they're currently working on um, a hybrid version of um, the Odyssey that is going to start in November um, 2022, so just in a couple of weeks um, in Nuremberg. While Punkt Live counts as a success of the digitally rendered um, theater expansion during the COVID pandemic, both Spellikin and Hoff also spoke of the urgent need for a vastly revised funding structure in order to adequately support dispersed artists collectives such as them that are no longer locally or even nationally bound. Um, so um, that's one of the sort of things obviously to further think about how these funding structures need to change to actually um, enable or, or support these sort of dispersive teams. So, but what I would like to show you now is just sort of a little trailer. Here you can see on the image, you can see some of the various um, windows that are open here. And I think the other thing that's really interesting is that would really what dramaturgically and, um, and so, so also in terms of set design is really happening here is that, um, that this production is really produced for the laptop computer screen. It's not um, produced for being shared or screened on a vast projector because the proximity of you, you um, the audience should have the feeling really that they are the ones that, that it is their screen they are looking at in a way. And so there's a sort of interesting identification process with that. And I'll show you a little bit, um, a trailer that has um, subtitles. So, wait a second. Yeah. Keine Ahnung, ich dachte, das ist vielleicht irgendwie merkwürdig, jetzt dann wir einfach so telefonieren, ohne uns zu kennen. Aber ich weiß nicht, ich, ähm, ich, ich finde, das fühlt sich merkwürdig natürlich an. Willi, ich bin so verwirrt. Ich, ich weiß nicht. Ich habe dir doch von Lotte erzählt, oder? Also davon, dass ich sie kennengelernt habe über Kleinanzeigen. Keine Ahnung, wir haben jetzt ein paar Mal telefoniert und ähm, wir verstehen uns einfach nicht. Bin ich, bin ich verknallt? Oder, oder bin ich verliebt? Ich, ich habe keine Ahnung, wie man diese Begriffe definiert. Und dann dachte ich, dann schreibe ich hier einfach irgendwie irgendwie mal zurück, einfach in so einem lustigen Text. Ja, und dann hat mir aber nicht sie geantwortet, sondern, dreimal darfst du raten, wer? Ihr Freund, dem das Profil eigentlich gehört. Ich habe auch... Okay, so that's where um, we'll end with... Um um, with Werther. So, um, but I think what you can see here in that, um, in that sort of uh, combination of screens is like how easily they move between the different ones and in, if, in the way that 
um, that there's really a sort of fictional world through the interweaving of platforms that is being created. Werther, Lotte and the other characters do not merely exist in a Zoom tile, um, but um, they have rich social media histories on Instagram, leave voice messages on WhatsApp and search the web. Um, not a single up, but the entire laptop screen partakes in the storytelling of this ill-fated love story. Um, and it is for the laptop screen as a proscenium that the piece is very intentionally designed. The, thus, Punkt Life may serve here as a representative example of uh, German methods and um, aesthetics and for a shift in theoretical um, perspective. They exemplify what Peter Auslander describes um, as, as the... Um, um, sorry, um, um, uh, describes as the audience's effective um, <clears throat> experience tied to the engagement with digital media. So Ausländer makes clear that it's necessary to uncouple the audience's effective experience from the event of the collective coming together in a shared space. And when he wrote that article in 2012 as an expansion of his original publication on liveness, this was more, I think, of a theoretically captivating but um, and prophetic description of the experience of digital reality generally. But in 2022, after the audience has become accustomed to Instagram monologues, live streams, digital immersive puzzle games and interactive Zoom comms, it's actually a very poignant definition of the experience of digital liveness. So um, I want to come to an, another example now, the other example um, that um, I would like to share today, um, which is part of, um, which really look at one of the theaters in Berlin that have made the most radical step in um, kind of engaging with um, this sort of digital move through the pandemic and the digital kind of theater move. Um, and that's the How Hebel am Ufer. Um, they're an international uh, production house, so they don't have their own repertory, but they have guest artists that come and they kind of are a big platform for the independent scene. Um, they do, um, so the How, more than many a German theater institutions, committed to the idea of a permanent digital expansion of theater and performance by implementing a fourth digital stage to add to their three uh, physical stages. The How Fear, as it is called, both offers um, a live digital, digital and on-demand performances, as well as discursive formats. It grows out of the House Spy on Me Festival that began in 2019, um, and that was there to investigate the role that digital cult culture has in on our lives. Um, and the How then went, uh, invited viral theatres to shadow some of its transition process as they were going um, into um, um, into this sort of like expansion into a, a digital sta uh, stage. And so we did interviews with the artistic team and guest artists alike and created a short video documentary out of which um, I want to show you a little excerpt now. Um, so the first half of that documentary is really about um, the artistic um, team and how they kind of thought about um, going digital. And I think the, the one thing to really note is like, how daring that was of how to do this because they also had to move their funds in order. So they had to take funds out of the first three physical stages and the productions that they were running there in order to enable this um, permanent digital stage. Um, and so that's the first half. And the second half that we are sort of entering in now for like a three minute period is going to be um, really the... Um, another view at sort of new digital artists that are sort of emerging and that are creating new formats. So to give you another sense of um, the sort of breadth of material that's there. Um, so there we go. Ich bin Mitglied des Kollektivs Digital Feminism. Ich bin Kuratorin, Kulturproduzentin und in meinem Daytime-Job bin ich die Geschäftsleitung des feministischen Magazins für Frauenfeminismagazin. Wir veranstalten Festivals, wir beraten Menschen, Gruppen, Häuser, die digital arbeiten wollen. Wir schreiben Texte, wir arbeiten prinzipiell sehr interdisziplinär. Wir interessieren uns nicht so für Genregrenzen, Theater, Bildung, Kunst, Diskurs, Wissenschaft. Und wir sind seit 2015 dran, an diesen Fragen, an diesen Schnittstellen von 
Theater, weil uns Theater als gesellschaftlicher Raum einfach sehr interessiert, ähm, auch als Ressource. Also von Theater, Feminismus und eben Technologie und natürlich auch dem Publikum eben. Also wie bringt man all diese Sachen zusammen? Das interessiert uns und dann nehmen wir uns immer genau das, was wir gerade dazu brauchen. Vieles von den künstlerischen Positionen, die Sie äh, eingeladen hatten, über, die, über äh, Handys zu zeigen, in einem analogen Raum, den wir bauen wollten, in Hot 2. Diesen Aspekt ist weggefahren, aber die, eigentlich die Inhalte blieben auch schlecht. Die, wir haben gemeinsam so entdeckt, es gibt auch ohne so einen analogen Raum. Und, also es war eine Entdeckungsreise, lass ich es mal so sagen, und was geht und was nicht geht. Wir als Gruppe und es ist nicht so, dass nichts uns passen würde, arbeiten sehr intensiv mit dem Haus zusammen, haben aber sozusagen faktisch für Publikum vor Ort noch nie was im Haus gemacht, obwohl wir jetzt seit anderthalb Jahren extrem viele Projekte zusammen machen. In the summer of 2020, Digital Feminism created an online residency that the artistic team Anna Fries and Malu Peters were a part of, with their digital essay The Host. Their collaboration is also an example of how digital performance translates back into the theater. Um, my name is Anna Price and I am, um, I call myself like maker of performing arts, preferably. Virtual Rooms is the second chapter of a work that I started two years ago, which is called The Host. The setup is, it's, it happens within a spatial sound installation. The audience takes place within that and they sit in this spatial sound setup and they have they experience this hybrid of live performance and VR. So our idea is that they go back and forth basically. Um, and that ideally maybe these two realities they kind of come together. It's really for me about yeah, showing pregnant bodies that we don't get to see often like in mainstream representation. We used the gaming engine Unity in order to create these alternative bodies and spaces. In doing so, they also developed their own new remote artistic work processes to match their new performance formats. For me, it was really like a moment of thinking, ah, this is what I always wanted to do. Like, this is also what I tried to do in theater, but I, it doesn't provide these options and now I can do it in unity and it's gonna stay, it's not gonna go away. I, I think I love creating and designing really intense experiences and of course with immersive works it's you, you have so many different levels to design in and then make that all come together. Okay. So I apologize for the super bad lag with the audio that I that isn't in the usual video. It has something to do with um with the sharing in now on the screen. So apologies for that. Um so the house work process here with guest artists such as Ulla Heinrich, who you heard at the beginning, um, um, but uh, exemplify how the opening of the digital stage also brought with it new collaborators and artists such as digital feminism um that um really brought new impulses and and that continuously worked online um and digitally rather than on stage it also allowed guest artists such as anna fries and malu peters anna fries who you've just heard of to uh, create a radically new formats um such as virtual rooms the one that you've just heard about so what you can see here now is the actual setup of virtual rooms the hybrid setup so um you alternate between having the um vr glasses on and then off and there's sequences that you experience in VR and sequences that you um, experience um, uh, in the space. So um, and there also um, and this virtual rooms is also a really interesting example of this sort of transformation process because it started with um, uh, Anna Fries and Malu Peters creating um, their work The Host which was a digital multimedia essay that was purely online 
and that then um, in the coming year from between 2020, that was 2020, 2021, they transferred that into a hybrid VR performance that they've just been talking about, in which the audience is back in the theater, but switches between different forms of immersion. There's, there's a sonic immersion um, in the space that surrounds everybody and that kind of unites everybody while the VR experience is individualized. Um, and in addition, a performer and their avatar become kind of wanderers between the virtual and the actual performance world. So for and Peter's work exemplifies an interesting process of translation and transposition. Um, and, um, and virtual rooms opens, in addition, also a utopian sort of VR space of um, uh, non-normative bodies and combines with it an interactive stage um, on which, um, and, and it's kind of the moving between these and navigating between these spaces that is really the interesting part for the, um, of the audience experience. So um, th their work shows how hybrid formats are poised to supersede um, the purely digital experiments of the interim phase of the pandemic. Um, and Anna Fries herself is an example for a shift away from an understanding of performing arts as necessarily um, based in a sort of co-present art form, right? She's really interested in the fact that in unity she creates, can create something that stays and she's a performing arts maker that doesn't necessarily depend on that sort of like life ephemerality um, that uh, traditionally we've been kind of thinking of in terms of theatre. Um, Right, so um, with that, um, uh, all that to say then that the pandemic both disabled the vast network of infrastructures in the cultural sector, but in the German context at least, also created new funding and production infrastructures to counter the dire effects of closure. These were temporary structures, and I think as we're now going forward with energy crisis and the war in Ukraine, the, um, the future of that looks very different and much bleaker, unfortunately. Um, and I now like to move on to my final example, which is our own performance experimentation with VR, which we developed as part of a um, exhibition in Berlin. So to probe the different forms of liveness and participation that we had encountered in our ethnographic research and documentation work with other artists and theaters, virtual rooms um, may count here as an example, obviously, of that, we created a short site-specific one-to-one performance to explore live hybrid um, encounters in VR. So, and we called that whole thing Marionette Theater 3.0. And the title um, really comes from, uh, I'll explain in a, in a second. So our question for this experiment was really, how can we create a social encounter across geographies? Um, and as a theat theatrical framing text, we used um, Heinrich von Kleist's seminal essay, um, on marionette theater from 1810, in which he discusses the non-human performer as excelling in virtuosity. So excerpts from the Kleist essay became the script for our piece and the score for this alive encounter that we try to enable between an audience member that um, uh, entered one space and an avatar and performer that was in another space and in the virtual space they connected. Um, and Kleist's essay obviously is here an interesting sort of um, intertext because it's as famous as it is cryptic. It abandons the idea of a human actor um, who is ultimately bogged down by their ability to self-reflect according to Kleist. And instead the animal and the puppet or marionette performer can outdo any human in terms of precision and virtuosity of their performance. Um, and we took this as a challenge for imagining Kleist's 18th century automata into the 21st century. So our marionette was an avatar that moved in real time and whose movements were generated by a, a performer in a motion capture suit. So here you can see some um, uh, images from the, um, uh, from the rehearsal period. Um, and it's kind of the interesting thing is also that, it's, um, that it is so very site specific. So it really integrates also with the space of this um, 18th century um, um, veterinary, uh, veterinarian theater that we, were, um, that we were allowed to use for the exhibition. Um, on, the, on the right, you can see our performer Jung Sung Kim, who um, is a dancer and who was performing as the bear. So the bear is one of the figures that um, Kleist refers to. And we recreated a bear avatar who then asks the audience member who you can hear now see in the middle um, on a stage below in a different space um, to dance with them. Um, and um, just to kind of give you like a breakdown of how that works. So you have 
of two physical spaces um, on the ground floor. There is an audience participant that enters into the VR via an Oculus Quest. Um, and upstairs, um, there are two performers, one in a, mo a motion capture suit, um, you've just seen, Jung Sung, and um, also um, a narrator figure who then um, is the one that kind of gives the voice to that performer. And so for us, it was also important to create two bodies that would merge into one upstairs and, um, and that would be um, combined the encounter that the um, audience um, met or the person that the audience member would um, encounter. Because there's a live audio and webcam connection to downstairs, but it's only in the virtual space that these two meet. So then, and um, the interesting thing and the kind of particularly innovative thing in terms also of the VR space that we created, and this is really due to um, my colleague Christian Stein's kind of immense um, creativity. So um, the entire, um, space um, of um, the um, the auditorium that we were rehearsing in and also the rotunda that sort of um, is um, the other space so these the ground floor space and the upstairs place both the spaces that we that anybody was moving in were mapped in VR so that they were entirely um, recreated so that in VR even if you're wearing the goggles and can't see um, you you experience a sort of virtual ver version of the same space and therefore can move around the space um, without any guardian or any sort of restriction um, and so for us the real kind of challenge was to kind of say how can we uh, create a life encounter here um, and that's what we um, then did so I'm just going to show you so these were the um, is how the space translates into a virtual space so you see um, the physical rotunda here which is the space that the audience member would enter and in the middle there is these four pillars and in the middle of that there used to be um, an elevator that um, could uh, transport um, the carcasses of the animals that were going to be um, dissected in this anatomical theater and that were, were going to be lifted up um, and we uh, recreated that elevator on the right in the virtual space so when you are entering that um, that space, you um, you can take the elevator up, and that's then where you will um, meet the avatar to um, play with them. But the innovation is really that what you see in VR is not just a film that plays off and that you are um, that is recorded, but that um, the meeting is actually a live meeting. And so the interplay between virtual and actual spaces um, is really one of the kind of important things that the um, the performance places. So we used this sort of geographic dispersion and created these three interwoven but separate spaces while retaining this intense dialogue with the 18th century building. Um, so by working with an interdisciplinary group of computer scientists, a VR developer and theater makers, we wanted to push the boundaries of both, yeah? What might be possible in theater and in VR. So in standard applications of in virtual space, people can encounter one another, but they are restricted by having to use static avatars. Physical expression is missing from these encounters and limits communication. Our motion capture systems transpose movements um, onto virtual human and non-human body shapes. In our marionette avatar theater, we have experimented with these possibilities to allow for a real virtual encounter. Um, and in terms of technology, um, the setup was as follows. So we used wireless MetaQuest 2 systems as our headsets, and then the model VR space geometrically copies the physical space, as I just explained. And the headsets then were furnished with dedicated laser calibration systems that allow for an exact, exact sort of mapping of the virtual onto the physical space and to allow um, the fusion of virtual with physical objects. Um, and so, um, that was kind of like um, the um, the core idea and the combined. So the the positional tracking is handled by an added mounted Vive tracker. Um, so upstairs uh, as well. So the combined data then is streamed, filtered, and fused to a steering computer in the space, um, and then streamed in real time to a Unity app. Um, and then Unity projects the movements onto an avatar that can be selected and positioned in space by the steering computer. And actually that positioning of the avatar was probably the hardest thing we had to do. And we had to do several um, layers of sort of locationing in order to make that happen. Um, and what 
ultimately becomes possible is the visitor and performer physically separate but virtually connected and um just to kind of close that off i'm, I'm going to show you um a short little clip from um from the rehearsals and also a clip from inside the vr and so that you kind of get a general sense of it So as you can see, you can see the performer and then you can see the bear on the computer. And that was just, and this were rehearsals where she was trying to kind of figure out what kind of movement might actually um, be workable and would look interesting uh, in the virtual space and how slowly or fast she had to move. And so she would do exercises, we were recorded, she would be able to look at the bear and then sort of like go back and forth um, between them. Um, so that's that and then like i'm just going to show you a very quick uh version of the oops sorry uh, of the um of inside the vr of course both invisible and impenetrable, seems to wrap itself around the free play of your gestures. No. Okay, oops, sorry. So um, um, I'll stop it there because we're sort of running out of time, but um, just to kind of give you a sense that there, there is basically the space as it looks actually um, in the actual space and you can move around in that one-on-one, -on -one, but then you also have virtual objects that you can interact with and that lead you eventually to the elevator that will guide you upstairs and once you're upstairs you will um encounter the other um avatar and that's kind of like the it's it's not like a performance in a big sense of the word it was just an experiment with the question of liveness um so to come to a close then um I've talked maybe a bit too much about as if pandemic experiments with digital technologies are entirely novel. The digital and machine theatres of the pandemic do not invent a new genre of performance, obviously. Scholars such as Gabriella Giannacci or Donna Haraway remind us that multimedia and transmedia performance and its theorization have a long and rich history in the 20th century already. Um, so um, Jennifer Starbuck, um, Parker Starbuck aptly framed some of that history in her book on cyborg theater. And she says, cyborg theater provides one mode of analysis, taking a fragmented and hybridized subject as a given, using it as a starting point to redress the subject and reframe and claim bodies once thought of as um, abject, object, subject, a cyborg subject on stage. So cyborg theater reframes the concept of the body through its technological expansion. That's kind of like the key of one of her of, of her argument. However, I would like to propose here that through the pandemic, there really is a shift in digital and hybrid theaters that have been developed, and they provide a radically different focal point of what uh, multimedia and transmedia experimentation with technology is aimed at. It's not so much. Um, the hybridized bodies and subjects of cyborg theater that are at stake here. The pandemic um, digital expansion of theater instead has its particular quality and goal in the dispersal of its audiences. And the claim it is here to make for the hybrid future of theater is that it has the potential to build spaces of encounter and to build community across geographies and thus opening up a global rather than a local dimension of theater. And with that, um, I would like to close and anything else I would be love I would love to talk about with Magda um, in um, in the discussion or with any of you that might have questions thank you so much for your um, patience and I will stop sharing now if I can somehow I can't find my All right. Um, uh, thank you so much, Ramona, for this wonderful lecture and for introducing us to both the uh, viral theater project, but also to all of those experiments that we have, you know, you, the, the, the theater makers in Germany have been doing during the pandemic, uh, particularly the, the transmedia ones. Um, so um, I think it was, you know, excellent, um, excellent lecture and we much appreciate um, 
sharing those things. Um, what do you think were, are the biggest challenges in archiving such performances? I mean, we know that there are already intrinsic problems with archiving image and video uh, in terms of, you know, what do you see? How do you, how do you index it? How, how you know, how do you, um, how does the archive actually work? Uh, what was in your in your in your experience? What was the biggest challenge in trying to archive transmedia performances, which might take place across all of these different platforms, and therefore, um, you know, are so dispersed in terms of where they happen? How does the documentation work in that, this case? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, I mean, I think there's one, obviously, the question of the obsolescence of technology that's in there, where you're kind of like wondering, so I might be archiving this, but you know, um, what are, you know, what's the hardware that I have to actually archive in order to be able to, um, to make sure that this will be still accessible if we are talking 15, 20 years down the line, or, you know, or even longer than that, right? So there's um, that question. Then, um, I mean, in some cases, like, you know, I mean, like I think the, um, the Punk Life example is a fairly easy one because on some level you have a recording of it at least, um, but in interesting ways, I can still go on the Instagram accounts now of these um, fictive characters and could um, interact with them then so you know so what do, uh, yeah. and so there's an interesting afterlife that these performances sort of have they never end in a way because they sort of uh, exist in that space so um and yeah to kind of figure out where do i cut where does one cut that off is then the recording the thing that you um that you store or in how far can you can you actually archive a whole instagram kind of like account and, and does that even does that even work and then what happens if you come into sort of a traditional archive like the um academy of the arts where you know like where the question is, you know, do I just give them a hard drive or, you know, and some of these things we're still actually just figuring out as we're talking because we're in the process now of doing that part of the translation project. So I think, yeah, so that's, I think the, I would say basically the fact that the performance in a way um, is extended so much beyond the idea of a German idea of Aufführung, yeah, of something that starts at a particular point and that ends at a particular point. But that's really then how to then navigate that and what to include or exclude is sort of like a really interesting and um, uh, and provocative question to to think to think through. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful point that there is sort of, you know, the open-endedness of it because it already uses pre-existing platforms, yeah? But then yeah. when you think about something like MySpace, which is sort of obsolete, you, yeah. say, you know, uh, will those platforms eventually become obsolete as well? And, uh, or will they somehow be preserved as artifacts of a particular internet era? I mean, that's that's sort of a big question about the internet in itself, yeah? How do you preserve this history of the internet in which way? So yeah, the, I mean, that's where the yeah. randomness maybe of that, you know, that can be an advantage and can be democratizing is obviously also then like a real problem, right? Because that means that, you know, if, if people lose interest, then it sort of just dies off, right? In a way where, you know, you, or it, it sort of becomes... Um, right. But I mean, like one of the other interesting things that we're showing in the exhibit is like a there's a, uh, a youth theater production in Berlin that was done on Gather Town. So the the set designer, um, in a sort of um, autodidactic move, kind of um, went onto a Gather Town and then created an entire set there and then an entire space where the whole performance could take place. And so this set and some of the remnants, I would say props of the performance, but these are also kind of little video things that were just recorded, etc. but not the whole performance, but these fragments sort of exist on there. So um, if you visit the exhibit, you can sit down at this computer and you can sort of like navigate through the space and find things and sort of get a sense of the performance and also get a sense at the same time through um, the sketches and the drawings that she's made on how she was trying to sort of navigate or create like um, what, what kind of thing she was kind of trying to create online and what the different steps and processes where she was doing there. So that's kind of like another way of trying to, um, you know, to, um, to create like a digital model of a of a set that then um, exists and that you can still access afterwards, and that kind of raises those questions also in interesting ways. I think. 
Um, this is uh, this is us. You know, the, the 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 big the big question that you also brought up is that that you know the the the, the, the many people have been sort of stuck on the definition of lioness as being primarily bound to the space. And what you're proposing after Oslander is to expand the definition of co-presence and liveness, so to speak, to more of a temporal, cerebral, um, affective uh, space. And that's not necessarily physically bound, but rather it's more of virtual in literal sense, but also in a kind of cognitive sense. Um, and yeah. so it's going to be it's going to be quite interesting for the theater people uh, to try to define that cognitive virtual space of the of the co-presence and and how do we affect it because this is going to actually i think influence in in many ways um how other um co-presences and how other realities in virtual spaces are being created so what's you know when do things become real for people in their heads and so misinformation and all you know, conspiracy theories and kind of fake realities how does this transfers the fiction into reality what is the point at which this it transfers and it makes it both real and uh, co-present for others mm. in the way that they imagine others to also believe or or um or encounter something as real um, so I think this is incredibly important research that you know that you, that you've been doing and that uh, many people have been doing in theater specifically to try to define it. Do you can you tell us a little bit what do you think is kind of the next step or how can theater play more visible role in a public um, debates around misinformation and around um, um, meaning making in transmedial environments? I mean, I think the interesting thing about like the liveness question is one, there's a temporal thing. That's obviously the easy way out, right? To just say, okay, we get rid of space, but we just maintain time and then to always mark the time and, you know, to kind of show that this is live through that. But I think actually something like the Punk Live thing actually shows that, um, you know, re-encountering the same characters on different platforms, sort of like giving them a sort of history. So, uh, not just having it on Zoom or not just having it exist on Facebook or whatever, but to be able to kind of find them again in a different um, in a different digital space and a different digital platform. That's something that really is an extremely sort of uncanny um, we encounter that then enhances the liveness, I think. And and the other thing is obviously interaction and participation that that substitutes. So um, and I feel in terms of I mean, what what um, quite a few I mean there is really interesting um project in uh, uh in uh, that was also one of the guests at the, at the how that um that we're trying to um they created a piece on um sort of fake news and um and um um right wing sort of like chat groups and 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 spaces and so uh, there it's kind of like an app um where you enter the app and you're being accustomed and um and familiarized with each chat rooms and with the with the sort of um uh, practices in these chat rooms so in a way you have to in kind of like in a Brechtian Lehrstück type way you have to embody the the sort of right wing position in order to understand how it works and then sort of and then it is undone over the course of the performance but it's um um but it's really an app that at that point is not even anymore like a temporal sort of liveness it's just you interact with the app and the interaction that the um that the app sort of proffers then allows you to experience and also to critique certain moves and certain strategies that are being made um in the digital space so i think actually um and this is also very much something that the um artistic direction at the how i have sort of stressed how much 
digital um, reality is, you know, part of our everyday reality. So understanding how it works is really important in order to claim a political position. So I think that's really to foreground that and to um, create um, performances, but also apps and interactions that um, that really move into that space. Um, um, I think that's the the way forward, really, in order to kind of be part of a political discussion and not just, um, you know, to transpose Shakespeare onto a digital stage, which is also great. But I mean, like, I'm just trying to think, you know, what are the discussions and the um, what's the public space that is being the digital public space, and how does it operate? Right. And to really kind of think about that and then intervene into that, I think is going to be the key. Um, and thank you so much, Amanda. That was a wonderful uh, explanation and elaboration of that, you know, sort of important issues um, of the day and how theater fits into that larger uh, conversation about um, internet misinformation and identity formation through virtual spaces um, in some way and meaning making and the reality making through virtuality. Um, this is this is ongoing dilemma, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, and now we know that in some ways, you know, this is how the wars are won, yeah? Uh, yeah. Is who holds the public square and who holds the real, whose version of reality breaks through. Um, and so, uh, so that's going to be um, ongoing problem and ongoing issue. Um, can you tell us, uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, German theater was very much supported during the pandemic, and now uh, things are a little bit different. Are you worrying that there will be a pullback? I mean, we, what we've seen in the U.S. and in U.K., for example, was a kind of a pressure, you know, to return to normal and all of the gain, not normal, like pre-pandemic normal, so to speak, and all of the gains of the pandemic, both in terms of experimentation and in terms of accessibility and uh, just playing, you know, reach of the audience that some theaters were managed to um, to get to because of the pandemic. With all of those gains of, of um, outreach, accessibility, experimentation, innovation, that they are being lost by this desire to just return to theater and continue doing um, a kind of, um, you know, live uh, performances, which are unavailable and inaccessible to many and um, not particularly rooted in contemporary reality, which is a hybrid reality that we are living in right now, yeah? So, yeah. Um, so is this is this happening in Germany as well, or do you see people kind of pushing through it and, and maintaining the momentum, or is, is there... No, it's it's very similar. I would say. I mean, like, um, I think we we continue to be better subsidized, uh, but you know, we were that from the get go, right? Um, but um, but I think there is a sort of like in most theaters, there's a big yearning for a sort of business as usual in a way. Um, but I'm kind of hoping, and you know, when I talk to a few dramaturgs and 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 theater makers that had been really experimental in the in the sort of digital sphere, they said, well, you know, I also really want to go back now and do something in person and like, you know, don't want to have to think about digital. But you know, at the same time, I think there's so many, so much of an expansion of a skill set that has happened, both for, you know, within the technology department, you know, the video department, the the dramaturgy department, also the acting, etc that ultimately I think we need to just wait a little bit longer. I think there's now you've kind of got the pushback and I'm wondering and I'm hoping actually that down the line, because people have like really worked hard to gain these new skills, that they will come back to using them and that then they will do that in sort of hybrid context. But I, I, would, I would agree that right now it looks kind of quite similar to what it used to pre-pandemic and yeah. and that I also find quite sad in in many ways um, especially with regards to the um uh questions of accessibility i mean i i will say that like um, I mean, similarly to the US and also the UK, there was a big debate that started in German theater about you know all forms of access and or, um, in terms of you know who gets to be on stage, who gets to, whose story gets to be told, et cetera, et cetera. So that sort of very principal kind of discussion about the definition of theater and, um, and the power structures of theater that, that has occurred. And I think that 
there's learnings that people have taken away from that. But I think the actual implementation of some of this stuff takes um, maybe longer than what was hoping for. Because I agree with you that I think, despite the fact that the pandemic has been such a um, horrible sort of intervention into our social lives, that in terms of what theater makers were able to do and how much they were willing to experiment, I think it was also an incredibly sort of like energizing moment in a way to kind of think, wow, you know, I mean, we can really rethink this and, and try something totally different and um, and people are willing to go there and, and support that. And so I'm hoping that both the experience of that and the feeling one gets from that and also just the skills that one has gained kind of means that in the medium term, this is going to kind of merge together in a more um, sort of productive way than is happening right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, people have been already working on some of those um, experimental forms before the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, a very marginal, very avant-garde-ish groups that were experimenting and there were, you know, few works that everybody kind of talk about, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and pandemic in some ways squeezed, I would say about 10 years of, research into like one year mm -hmm. and then the skill acquisition as you're saying you know uh, all of all of those sort of uh, thinking that would typically take maybe 10 to 15 years have been uh, squeezed and shortened in a kind of a you know quick course on digital theater and digitalization and and, and hybrid performance and transmedia performance and so so um there is a certain maybe the compression right now after the, the sort of quick period of compression of knowledge and 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 skill skill acquisition, and perhaps now after you know the sort of the period of decompression again, there will be some kind of Hegelian synthesis between the the, the purely live and um, and purely digital and you know and the kind of hybrid uh, form the, un the the unification of thesis and empire. So I'm trying to think about it in terms of Hegel's um, um, Hegel's dialectic. Um, what's going to happen at the end is mm -hmm. of hybrid yeah. format, and people will come back to that sort of experimental spirits of the pandemic of the early pandemic. Um, all right. Uh, um, uh, do we have any questions from the audience members? Let me see. I think we have a comment. Um, yeah, and uh, and from, from Johanna. Yeah, I think, Johanna, you're totally right in, uh, in calling me out. Part of it was actually I had a really big problem. I was going to do something slightly different, but I had a really big problem with my <laughs> my mouse not being visible and I couldn't exit, the, um, exit my presentation, which I had wanted to do several times to kind of do something more mixed up. Um, but, um, but thank you for, for mentioning that. And in terms of the uh, Laurie Anderson lecture, I totally agree. And I think um, that's obviously one of the other things that is, it's totally new formats what, that one also has to develop in order for this to work um, online in terms of talks and lectures, etc. And actually, one thing that we're doing that our students in this digital theaters seminar are kind of experimenting with that and are really trying to kind of find lots of different um, interesting versions of how zoom dialogues and interactions can kind of happen so so yeah it was uh there was um and the various technological complications getting into the zoom and also using the zoom on a computer that isn't mine so that um, I, I blame that so yeah the question was um why did we choose a more traditional format of the lecture for this discussing this experimental you know format of a performance and um, I think that, you know, the lecture itself is a form of documentation and archivization. I mean, we, we've been trying to document and um, those performances for the, for the last uh, two or three years. And so the lectures themselves are like a sort of archival, um, archival material of how the performance has changed in the last three years, depending on what people talk about and how they talk about it, yeah. So in some ways, we're using the simplest format in order to make sure that it's preserved and and it captures that particular moment, conversation that is happening at this particular moment. All right. Um, uh, thank you so much, Ramona. This was really excellent. I'm thrilled that you will, we will be hosting and co-chairing the rest of, this, of the seminars. I invite everyone to join us to check out our schedule. Uh, there are many cool lectures coming up. 
um, and um, they will be in hope no traditional format, but uh, but they will cover um, a lot of different content, a lot of different performance traditions from all over the world. So I invite everyone to join us uh, and uh, thank you again to MetaLab and to Mahindra for hosting us. And thank you so much to Ramona for presenting her research and for introducing us to those experiments that have been happening in German theater uh, during the last two years. Uh, thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Magda, and thank you, everybody.